Hi, welcome to, I'm not sure what to welcome you all to, uh, this is the These Football Times podcast team um, trying something new, it's a, it's a little pilot project we've got, it's a visual podcast for tonight and I'm sure next time you see us we'll have, we'll have something else. Uh, my name is Stuart Horsfield and I can introduce Mr Stephen Scragg. Hey Stu, how are you? Good. <laughs> We're all right, yeah. It's Excellent. a bit different, but, but it's good, yeah. <laughs> it is very different. Mr Gary Thacker. Hi Stu, I'm never more conscious about the length of my perishing hair. With that, um, Mr. Aidan Williams. Aidan, how are you? It's <laughs> just fine. No problems in lockdown. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously we we'll, we'll kick this off with a subject, um, and we're looking at we're, we're toying around with the idea of a one ticket in time. So that, <laughs> that's what we thought we'd practice with. So we're going to take everyone back to the 25th of June, 1988, uh, and the European Championship final between the Netherlands and the USSR. Uh, so I suppose to start off with, then we'll let, let's start with the head men, the managers, Rinus Mikkels and uh, Mr. Lobanovsky. So Gary, do you want to start us off with the two with the two men at the helm? Well, certainly I'm happy to talk about Mikkels. Um, obviously, uh, 14 years before this, in the same stadium, Mikkels was manager of the uh, the Orange that uh, fell so close to winning the World Cup against Germany, West Germany as it was in those days, obviously, um, in the World Cup. And uh, it's, it was, it's, it's sort of fitting, I guess, that, you know, he returned to the same stadium and got the Dutch over the line for the first and so far only time in a major tournament to uh, win the trophy. Uh, it, I think this was his third um, uh, tenure as manager of the Dutch national team. And uh, although it wasn't the team of Cruyff and Nieskins and, uh, and Hulsaf and uh, Rensenbrink, they won a bad team, Hollett, Van Basten, Roy Card. So it was a great Dutch team and it was great. Personally, you know, I'm a fan of, massive fan of Dutch football and great to see them win the trophy. So, you know, big up to Ross Mikkels on this one, guys. <laughs> Stephen Lobanovsky for you. Lobanovsky, oh, he's the scientist, isn't he? You know, it's, it's football by science. You know, we did so much with, with Dinamo Kiev over such a long period of time and then these flirtations or associations with the, the Soviet Union as well. But, you know, by 88, they're probably at their peak. Uh, they've played absolutely fantastically well at, at Mexico 86 without uh, the injustice, really, of not getting beyond the last 16. You know, throw Denmark in there as well, exactly the same. Uh, you know, so 88 was almost like a, a rebate on not going as far as they should have done in 86. Aiden, I guess maybe um, I won't. I won't say it's an age thing, but I think you've got the uh, the pleasure maybe of being the youngest on here. Um, <laughs> in, in, in t- we, are, we are all pretty similar in age, to be fair. Um, obviously, with regards to the two managers, you know, like we like we said there, they're almost probably the last, not the last of the old school, but they sort of harked back to a previous generation. Yeah, absolutely. And they're both kind of revolutionary as well. And kind of during the 70s, in, in both of their cases, I guess, they pushed the game forwards in similar similar ways, but slightly variant, but tactically and um, revolutionising in, in the Dutch in the Dutch way anyway, the total football that Mikkels was part of, I guess, at instigating at Ajax before bringing it to Holland, although it was taken on by others at Holland to push it, even, at Ajax, sorry, to push it even further. But at international level, he was key to, to that development, along with Cruyff, obviously, and, and Lobanovsky as well, bringing in what he developed with, with Kiev in the 70s and, and through into the 80s as well, bringing that into the international arena. That sort of marks this particular clash as, as, as a, big, uh, a big clash of dominant managers, if you like, and, and people who've, who've been there and done it already, just not quite at the, at the very cutting edge of a final in, in international football yet. Um, I suppose b- before we get to the final, because obviously that's what we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about. But I suppose <laughs> even these are these are two teams. You know, we're looking at the eight team, the old eight team tournament, and the two finalists essentially come from the from the same group. Yeah, played each other early on. Uh, you know, a, a game that you know was was interesting in itself. We could have picked that game really. It's it's it tends to go under the radar, but you know we'll all remember Vasily Rat's winner in it and. Uh, you know, it was the Dutch first game in a major tournament since 1980. 
So there was a huge amount of expectation on the Netherlands. You know, I think even the fact that they'd not been around for eight years in a major tournament, going into the tournament, they were one of the favourites. For many people, they were the favourites. You know, they played England at Wembley a few months earlier in one of the most one-sided two-all draws, I think, I've probably ever seen. Played some beautiful football in it. And, uh, and, and we mentioned, maybe mentioned him, was uh, John Bosman was, was very omnipresent in that match, who many thought was, was going to be the, the Marco Van Basten of the tournament. You know, he was one of the standout stars going into the tournament and, and Van Basten had uh, he'd been injured playing for AC Milan, missed a huge chunk of the season, came into the squad as a bit of a wild card. He wasn't fully fit and Bosman was leading the line. Played in that initial game against uh, against the Soviet Union, and it was the only game he started. You know, Bosman came in, uh, so Van Basten came off the bench, and uh, I think I think Bosman was restricted to about eleven minutes beyond that. Um, so it was a bit of a scene setter. You know, the, the Netherlands lost it. There was a huge amount of expectation on them, and then, uh, but it it kind of shaped the rest of the tournament more so for the Netherlands than it did for the Soviet Union. I suppose, Gary, just just quickly, um, I suppose it it can't get obviously a, a connoisseur of Dutch football, but I suppose it should be mentioned briefly the, uh, the semi final victory over West Germany with regards to what happened in '74. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, there's so been so much um, written and spoken about the the uh, rivalry between the Dutch and the Germans, and '74 uh, uh, was a massive thing, and there was players in that, uh, Wim van Hannigan particularly, who was sort of really had a terrible dislike for the Germans because of, he'd lost his two brothers in a bombing ride in the Second World War. And in 74, we're only talking 30 odd years since the end of the, uh, uh, when we get around again, yeah, 30 odd years, since, just over 30 odd years since the end of the Second World War. So that, that sort of rivalry is still, that uh, anger, that, that distrust is still a rabid. And it went on from there because the, the Dutch always felt that the Germans had, cheated in that final and uh, this was built and it was a massive thing for in, in 88 then for the Germans to uh, face the Dutch in Germany again and the Dutch overcame them even though they, it was a, a perhaps a less convincing performance than the Dutch had given in the 74 final um, and they, they were one goal down and they secured the, the, the win with a late goal from uh, Van Basten uh, and it was massively important it was almost it was almost more important than the final for the Dutch culture to, to beat the Germans and uh, they celebrated so massively after that game that they almost forgot the final. It's a bit like in 74 when they scored the, scored the first goal and then absolutely literally forgot to score the second goal to kill the game off. So history repeated itself, but actually on this time they actually got over the line. Um, Aidan, I suppose, you know, get, coming to the final, Stephen's kind of mentioned some of the changes there with regards to the Dutch side, but I guess going into that final, you know, for the USSR, there was a lot of, a lot of change in, you know, Stephen mentioned that a lot of the changes for the Netherlands was made early on in the tournament and then it was a settled side, but then you, you come to the Soviet Union, it's almost the reverse, and going into that final, they were probably the more unsettled or with a more unfamiliar lineup. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the key one in the back line, I guess, is Oleg Kuznetsov was suspended following the um, semi from yeah the semi final, get another yellow card. But they also had to rejig their defence a little bit. So I guess some of the solidity that had seen them through a hundred percent record in the group, of course, and then their semi final, they they cut through a decent Italy team um, as, as though they were vastly inferior opposition. It was only two 0 but. It was a, a clinical 2-0. It was, it was in, in effect, more than that, really, the, the way they played and dominated. So these changes, particularly to the back line, prompted some changes from the midfield as well, I think, to cover in the back, and that disturbed their rhythm, rhythm a little bit, I think. But um, the way they actually started this final, though, they, 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 were, they were on the front foot from the off. They, they settled the better, and they, they got going <coughs> well. So, I mean, yeah, they were unsettled I guess and a few changes but it didn't seem to affect them in the early stages anyway. It's funny I mean you know we'll, we'll come to the game now you know we, we've set the scene or you well you guys have I as always I haven't done anything um, you guys have set the scene you guys have set the scene nicely yeah Stephen Aiden's alluded to it there um, you know we, we've all watched the game we all watched it albeit in a foreign language I'm sure we've all learned be it Dutch, <laughs> German, French a bit of, we've had a bit of all sorts between us um, 
you know, and, and so it, it forces you to concentrate on the football rather than the year, if you like. There's, there's, well, certainly I wasn't swayed by any Dutch commentary, <laughs> I don't know what they were saying. But, um, it, you know, Aiden started out there, Stephen. It, you know, it was the, the, uh, the Soviet Union, really, that did settle a lot. Although it's a 2-0 game, it, it seemed to me that, uh, certainly for the first half hour, it, it seemed like the Soviet Union were the far more settled, comfortable, confident side. Yeah, they had the faster start. I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't like a, a domineering start. There was a, I think there was a certain kind of, almost like a chess kind of effect early on. We were feeling each other out and it was a case of, you know, don't make an early mistake, don't give anything away. But I think what it kind of impressed me was just how there was a lack of kind of like, there was no risk for the ball being taken. You know, and, and that's the, the beauty in it, is that all the passes were measured. You know, there were very little in the way of long balls being played and those that were played. You know, it wasn't like watching an English game where the ball was just played into a dangerous area of the pitch and, and let's see who gets on the end of it. You know, any long ball was a long pass. You know, it, it was, everything was, was targeted and both teams were, were doing that. But yes, the Soviet Union got off to the, the more... I think assured start. You know, they, they 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 certainly had more of the ball, and I think they were more positive with it. You know, the the, the Netherlands were comfortable in possession, but they were wanting to keep possession rather than kind of like go on the offensive very early. It's funny it, it's, um, you're saying that I, I, when I was watching it, and I, it was bizarrely once once the two keepers Van Brooklyn and Dassey have had the ball in their hands, it was like a Premier League game. I think I ended up, I think there was, because I watched all the first half and thought there's no long kicks from the, from the keeper's hand. Everything was played um, short by the goalkeepers. And if you watch it, I think there's probably maybe two or three times where the ball goes long from the goalkeepers. And it was, it, it would have felt strange watching it because we were used to watching English goalkeepers go long. But when watching it the, um, watching it the other night and it, it didn't seem strange because that's how we're used to seeing goalkeepers play now. But, but you're right, the, the long balls were played out of defence and were measured passes. And it was, it was something that, that struck me after sort of 20, 30 minutes of watching it. that The keepers played everything out the back and it was, it was good to see. Um, Gary, you know, for you, you know, Stephen's talked there about, the, about the, the, sort of the more measured start. But again, first half hour, I suppose really the Dutch, the Dutch struggled to make an impact. Now for me... I mean, Rude Hullet will always stand out on a pitch physically, even just by physical, physical appearance. But for me, and this is only my perspective, but he, as, a, as a Dutch player, he seemed to be the pick of the Dutch players. And yet he was wearing the number 10 shirt. But we were all used to number 10s in the 80s. The Zico, Maradona, uh, Platini, Francescoli. You know, he didn't play in that role. But, you know, there were moments where, a bit like Cruyff in 74, he was taking the ball almost as a centre-half. Yeah, it was very much, I mean, in essence, I suppose, you know, you would say, and it's always an arguable point with the Dutch team, that he was actually playing as a striker alongside Van Basten. But, you know, as is, as is the one to Dutch football, they wander around the park like, you know, like a lost soul almost. Well, almost, no, no, not like a lost soul, like a soul that's not lost, I should say. That's found a purpose. And, uh, yeah, all it's, um, this, all it was at this time was almost like the height of his powers. And a magnificent physical specimen, so quick, so strong, Dominant, and I think you know Steve is absolutely right when he mentions about how, how the the Soviet Union team settled quicker, uh, and they did. And I think there's a there's a there's a was a huge carryover from the Dutch failures of the past to getting so close and falling over at the last hurdle. That the there was always a thing with the Dutch in '74 and '78 that arrogance beat them. And he, I think in this game, and I was watching the game when we was when we were sort of uh, was, was researching for it. That they seemed nervous, uh, um, hesitant, and unconvinced almost of their own ability to win the game. And I think that that first part of the game that Steve mentioned, where they're almost like like shadow boxing, almost. Um, you know, you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to. You don't want to be too 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 much about landing a punch on the other guy, but you don't want to concede. And the Dutch were a sort of almost settling to be the second best team on the park, but thinking they had perhaps the most potent strike force in the end. That can make the difference. It, it's, I mean, it, it's interesting that you know, Aiden. To, to me, you know, I mentioned Hullet there, but for me, the first half hour, probably the most prominent player was, was Belenov. Um, seemed to be involved in a lot of a lot of what the Soviets were doing 
um, in that in that sort of first half hour, first thirty minutes, and you know we'll come to Hullet's goal in the first half of the set. But obviously, Van Brooklyn for me was the, was the busier, shall we say, of the, of the two keepers. He wasn't overly busy. It wasn't a, a demanding day at the office for either keepers. But at the end of the day, but to me, it just seemed that that Belenov was was everything that was. I suppose summed up what the, what it was the Soviets were doing in the first half. He did. Uh, he was the sort of pivot that it all came through for them going forwards, at least anyway. And I, I'm just wondering from what Gary was saying there, whether the, the hangover for the Dutch had anything to do with the way they celebrated their semi-final, as well as <laughs> sort of general inferiority, perhaps. They, you know, they, they thought they had it done after that in terms of what was big for them. The final was kind of the, the lesser thing, wasn't it? So I wonder whether there was any of that. But yeah, coming back to Belenov, he, he was key to what the, the Soviet team were doing. And um, sort of midway through this first period, I guess towards the middle of the first half, the, the Soviets did create a couple of chances or at least get a couple of breaks through, uh, which he, he'd been involved in. Protosov ended up getting through uh, as well. In fact, he got through twice. Once, I mean, I, I don't know what the, the rest of you think, whether it might have been a penalty in the first half as well and Protosov was brought down by... That's <laughs> It was made of it at the time, but... It looks slightly suspicious. Yes, <laughs> um, <guess> not. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I think so. Yeah, you know, Stephen. You know, the, the goal comes really from the first time that that Dasev is really tested from Hullet's free kick, and you know, from the resultant corner comes comes the opening goal. Yeah, you know, there's the the free kick, and, and Dasev makes this wonderful, wonderful save. You know, and, and it, it should be a settler for Dasev. So it's it's a bit of a kind of like a, an oddity that the fact that he, he's picking the ball out the back of the net about 30, 40 seconds later. But, you know, what a, what a goal. You know, the fact that Van Basten's goal tends to overshadow Hullet's goal. Yeah, Hullet's goal is a, a magnificent goal. The power he gets on that header, you know, the, the cross from the right, the ball played back over into the centre and there's Hullet. And it's just one of those blindsiding type of goals where it doesn't matter how good your defence is. And yes, there have been changes to that Soviet defence, but they were still all fine individual players. You know, they, they were still left with that kind of like the back doors open and there was Hullet powering that head of it. Gary, for you, um, is it, obviously I'm not talking about the, the quality of Van Basten's goal, which, you know, we'll come to it, you know, and all three of you, you know, we can chat about, about both goals. Um, but Hullet's just just as iconic, but I think for it's the shake of the dreadlocks, isn't it? That go from yeah. not because you've got long hair at the moment, but it's from it goes from <laughs> sort of the whole the, the power that Steve Bridge there that's generated the whole it's that it's the dreadlocks that that swing and almost seem to generate that extra little bit of power in the header. Absolutely right. You know, we're talking about Desa, who is an exceptional goalkeeper. I mean, one of the best in the world at this time, and you know. I don't care. You could put four goalkeepers in there. You could put 68 goalkeepers in there. You ain't stopping that one, kiddo, because it's almost like a cannon. And, you know, the, it, it's... it's Van Basten's goal is special. But um, I think, always think Hullet's goal was like a statement. You know, this is it. This is, you know, we, we're having this goal. There's, there's not a great deal you could do about this. What's this ball? It's my forage. It's going in the back of the onion bag. You can do it. You don't well like Tiger. Um, and it's like a statement, you know, this, once that goal went in, I think, I think it was almost destined that the Dutch were going to win. It, it, it sort of breached the dam a little bit. And um, the, the, after that, they, they thought, you know, the, any doubts they had, any hesitancy they had after that. And they hadn't played well, you know. Um, you know, this, this, just sort of drifting back a little bit, very, very, very briefly, this was the classic final. You know, we've, in the past, you know, there's been five World Cup finals, European Cup final, European Championship finals, where you think, if only this team had played this team or whatever in the classic final. Well, this was the classic final. Um, in 74, uh, the Netherlands against Poland would have been the classic final, not West Germany. But this was the classic final. They're probably the two best teams in the tournament. And um, as I say, when that goal went in, I, I couldn't actually think. I couldn't, I couldn't see no matter how the game went. It was a statement goal. It was, it was a real statement goal. Um, a bit against the real uh, player, though, do you think? Sorry? What, sorry? A little bit against... Against the runner play at the time, though, wasn't it? So I think that's it, the whole it probably point. served to help yeah. settle them down. Yeah, it actually. I mean, that's the whole point. It actually was against runner play. You know, they hadn't been the better team, but the, as I said, that's why I'm saying it was a statement goal. It sort mm. of said, okay, well, what, whatever's gone now, we can put that behind us now because we know we know we can score against you. We know we're going to win now. 
that it, it sort of, as I say, breaks the dam of, 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 um, of hesitancy. And Aidan, you know, Van Basten, you know, it's his header that goes back across, which I only realised, clearly not through my Dutch translation, although I could pick up his name. <laughs> but I never, I never realised up until the other night that it was actually a, a Van Bat for a, a man who has a relatively quiet game. His impact is actually, and I suppose that's what strikers do, isn't it? You know, it's his cushioned it's header. moments, isn't across. it? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much the first thing he'd done in the whole match, though, really. I mean, there's yeah, very, very little uh, impact at all. I think, oh, it was a lovely cushioned header back across, wasn't it? Hullet had kind of found a bit of space, or well, that's one way of looking at it. The other way would be the Soviet defence had wandered off a bit too far, but that's a bit negative, isn't it? It was, it was a nice bit of play. He found a great bit of space, lovely little header across, and yeah, I think the dreads helped the power of Hullet's header. Um, so I'll, we'll go into the second half then, and I suppose, again, really, it's all in the opening, I suppose the opening 15 minutes. Um, all three of you can chat about the goal. Aidan, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let you go first because you had to pick up Van Basten's assist for the first one. So, <laughs> you know, you know we, Van Basten's goal. Off you go, lads. I don't need to tee you up for this. There will never be a better goal in a championship final. There you go. There's the statement right from the off. This <laughs> is the best goal. <laughs> they are up for debate, perhaps. But to me, this is the best. Um, it, it was a seemingly massively overhit cross. I mean, the whole move started from a, a poor bit of play out from the from the Soviets, where the ball was miscontrolled, uh, and the Dutch got it back in midfield out to Muir and a huge looping cross that pushed Van Basten almost to the byline. Uh, uh, he said afterwards that he was so tired in the second half. I don't know why, because he hadn't really done much. But they, maybe it's those celebrations after the Germany game. Uh, yeah coming back to Hortman, but he, he said afterwards he was so tired in the second half, even though this was only 10 minutes in the second half, that the thought of trying to control it and do anything with it was seemed a bit beyond him, so he thought, oh, why not, I'll just have a, have a go and hit it. It was the most beautiful, sumptuous volley you could ever imagine, looping just sufficiently over Dasayev, rocking the keeper back on his heels as though, as though uh, punch drunk almost, and flying into the corner of the goal. It was just magnificent. Absolutely magnificent, Stephen. For you again, and I, I mean, I knew it was, I knew it was, a, it was an Arnold, a deep Arnold Muir and cross, but that's obviously the same Arnold Muir that had pitched up at Portman Road, nearly, nearly ten years earlier. Which, as a kid, I hadn't put the two together, but as as time has gone on, <laughs> I've realised it's the same guy. <coughs> yeah, well, that was it. That was one of the, the the best things for me in that tournament was was the the blossoming or the you know, this Indian summer of of Arnold Muir. You know, he'd missed out on the, the tournaments of the 70s and, you know, they stopped qualifying after 88, after 1980. And then here he was, I think he was about 37, 38 doing this and he was pulling the strings. And that, uh, that ball, that cross he puts in, it, it's a first time cross as well. Uh, you know, he doesn't control it, he just hits it, you know, and, and, and which will kind of be understandable, the, the, the over hit. With it. But you know, if he under hits it, that goal never happens. You know, and, and as Aidan says, you know, Van Basten you know, claims to be tired, and, and, and he would have been. You know, he'd, he'd missed so much football throughout eighty-seven, eighty-eight club football. He, he'd come back, you know, scored some important goals in the title race, but he, it, it had been cameo appearances. He'd either been a substitute or he'd start games and be withdrawn early. And then here he was from kind of like the well, it wasn't even the second game, the the initial game against the Netherlands. He was thrown on with about half an hour still to play, and then he played every minute from there on in. So, you know, that's like four games plus half an hour in about two and a half weeks when he'd he'd only played sporadically uh, and missed about and missed a good five months of that season as well. So, you know, I can fully buy into the fact that he was feeling it even so early in the second half. So to to hit this shot and and it's the technique, you know, it's just the way that it lands. And he and he just it just rips the net, and the fact that you know and 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 the the, the cherry on the cake is is Dasiev's reaction to it, and it's not just Dasiev's reaction to it. You know he does like Aiden says he staggers around like he's been punched, and and it's like you know Mike Tyson's at the peak of his powers boxing wise, and he he just <laughs> resembles somebody who's been hit by Mike Tyson, and and it's the shock of all, it's just the absolute shock and all of it. Even down to kind of like you've got uh, Renus Meikles who, who gets to his feet with his head in his hands 
because it's almost like a disbelief into what, what he's, he's just seen. So the celebrations of the players on the pitch, you know, even you know, Bam Basten himself, it's this look of kind of like, you know, ecstatic shock is the only, the only kind of like terminology I can come up with. Uh, Gary, uh, this is also an Austin right? 23 years old, Bam Basten, um, in, the 88, in the 88 final. Hullet, 25. Uh, Rijkaard, 25. Koeman, 25. But, you know, coming back to Van Basten's goal, 23 years old. And it, it's funny because you only need to see a, a, a photograph of Van Basten's celebration, which is incredibly simple, one arm in the air, very Alan Shearer-esque. But you know, the goal is so iconic, you can tell from a photograph of the celebration what goal has just happened. Yeah, it's one of these sorts of, um, once you've seen, you never forget it. Um, and, you know, I mean, Aidan's right when he mentioned that Van Basten, you know, hadn't been in the game hardly, but he, he, he sort of created one goal and scored the other, won the title. So, you know, I, I played two of them, I suppose. But uh, it always reminds me, uh, uh, <laughs> I had a friend was playing, was playing with a team he's played for many years ago. And uh, <laughs> this guy had not got a left foot. He couldn't even stand on his left foot, let alone play with it. And the ball was going out to the left-hand side of the area. And he swung his left foot in, in pre it was almost Van Basten-like. And he's, I said, Andy, what are you doing, mate? He says, well, I couldn't be bothered to go and fetch the ball, so I thought I'd eat it. And then, I mean, Van Basten didn't think that, but it wasn't that far away. It was one of these things that, you know, if he'd have stopped and said, well, okay, what I'm going to do is try and bury this in the far corner. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't do that. There's a natural, it's, it's instinctive, it's, it's natural, it's talent. It's not, there's no calculations involved there. It was just pure skill. And, uh, you know, Steve mentioned Bosman earlier. And um, John Bosman, who uh, uh, I actually put, uh, bought to replace um, Mambasta when he went to, to Milan because um, he'd missed obviously the qualifying and, and Bosman had, had, I think was top goal scorer in the qualifying scored nine goals and that doesn't include the goals that were wiped out when the, the Dutch were beating Cyprus in like 10-1 the game was called off into crowd trouble and this guy couldn't get a game afterwards but Mikkels knew the key guy was in the big game was Van Basten and tell you what they need just to deliver <laughs> yeah, me just. Um, so I suppose really the last, not saying the, the last part of the game, but I suppose the last, the last pivotal moments then um, fall to Bell and off Aiden. You know, he hits the post, he gets a penalty, he misses the penalty, and and I suppose with that is, is a sense of inevitability. I think after those incidents, yeah. So it was two within about two minutes, wasn't it? The the post and then the the penalty uh, saved by Van Broekelen. After those, the Soviet Union seemed to tail off a bit, didn't they? It's as though they'd lost heart or lost belief that it, they could actually turn it around then, even though up until that point, as we said, prior to the second goal as well as prior to the first, they were, they were playing well and it was slightly, I guess, against the run of play again. But for Belenov, I guess, he, just before the Hullets goal as well, he'd, he'd had a chance saved a couple of minutes before that, not as clear cut as the penalty, obviously, but the two key pivotal moments of the game where he'd had good chances and he, he could have could have made the story go a bit differently. Unfortunately for him, for a great player, it didn't quite work out. But we can only speculate of what might have happened if this shot or the penalty had gone in. We'd had a 2-1 game with 30 minutes still to go. Uh, I think, I think it, it would have been a really, really good game after that, as opposed to what was an OK game with some real star highlights in it had that goal gone in either of those goals sorry gone in it, it would have been a, a really great last half hour it could have been it could have been one of the great games one of the great finals had that happened but I guess we'll never know <laughs> yeah we should play that instead uh, let's, yes. let's play that that's a sister, <laughs> the sister podcast perhaps yeah. we'll, we'll talk about what might have been uh, Stephen but you know with Belenoff's miss was was that I know you, and like Ian said you never can say but is that when the, the sort of the the final, the final throw of the dice, if you like, was it game over with the penalty miss? Oh, definitely. I mean, it was a shame that it was it, it ended up being like that, but mm -hmm. you know, the the Soviets just started to to shrink within the game from there on in. You know, uh, I mean, if you watch the you get the chance to watch the footage, you know, within the penalty, there's there's some massive gamesmanship that goes on as the as you know Belenov is waiting to take the penalty. And I think it's Gotsmanov that's on the floor being treated. And uh, I think it's Reichard, it's Van Broeklin, and even Muren 
all all have a word in 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 Belmont's ear. So they're all they're all talking him, and uh, and yeah, you know it's it's a you know it's a, it's a masterpiece of of talking someone out of scoring a penalty, basically. You know, Sorry, and, I and, suppose. And oh, sorry, Stephen. Go on. Oh no, you go. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I mean, you know, for you, Gary, I suppose it's interesting where you where, when we've talked about European Championships before, and you've watched finals from around the world. I guess as a big fan of Dutch football, that the missed penalty just as celebrated just as much as uh, Van Basten's goal. You know, when, and I do remember this really well. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a lot older than you guys, so I was sort of you know I remember this really well. And I never expected him to score. I just thought it was, this was fight. The Dutch were fighting to win this. When Hull had scored that first goal and then Baston buried that one. I thought there's no way they're not going to win this game. And when he hit the post as well, it, I just think, no, this is fighting. It's crazy challenge by Van Brooklyn to give away the penalty. What on earth he was doing, I don't know. But he, I never thought he was going to score. I, I just thought this game was fighting for the Dutch to win. And, uh, you know, they hadn't been the best team in this, but they've been the best team in the past and not won. And they weren't the best team now, but they got over the line. This and this because I, I, it was just the gods of football had, had smiled on them in this game. It, it's just that simple. It wasn't a great game. It was great goals. Um, the Soviets were, were a really entertaining team. Really played some fantastic football. And on balance of play, we may well have been the better team on the day. But it was just I think the Dutch were just fighting to win this game. Perfect. Um, I suppose really the, the last thing really, I mean, you know, I think we can all agree, as Gary's just said there, it's a, a relatively poor game that we ended up picking in a rush that actually had great moments. It's incidentals, as, as Stephen likes to call them always. But I suppose, you know, the last, the last minute or so really, you know, mentioned how young that Dutch side was. Um, and so the three of you, um, what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess for the Dutch, it didn't quite turn out how they hoped after this, did it? They, they had, well, they faced West Germany again in qualifying, I think, for the next World Cup. And then they faced them again in the knockout stages of the next World Cup. Uh, and it didn't go so well, did it? Uh, um, then, well, I suppose, following on from that, though, a few years later, we got the emergence of Bergkamp and a new gen generation who could mix with, with some of the older ones, even though many of them have chosen not to play <laughs> after a few tournaments, Hullet in particular. Um, so they, they still carried on from strength to strength uh, to an extent, but not quite hitting this, this high again, uh, even though they've been to a few finals since, but not quite made it. They, they seem to, I guess it's a similar story from the 70s to, to this tournament that's happened since. That they've either been absolutely terrific, gone out in disgrace, or just simply not qualified. There's, there's nothing in between. There's no sort of average performance, is there? It's either really, really good or, or terrible. Stephen, for you, um, I suppose, um, I'm not, I mean, you can't win a European Championships and say that you failed to reach potential. But as we mentioned, the spine of that team, other than Van Brooklyn in goal, but the spine of that team really at that age could and should have done better in future tournaments. Yeah, they had the chance to, to do kind of what Spain would do a generation later, is to win a succession of tournaments. And, but that's the the fragility about the Netherlands, isn't it? It's that, you know, is it is it an off period? You know, are they symbiotically falling apart? You know, is the personality clashes and cliques within the in the dressing room? And that's always that always used to be, you know, the the big question about about the the Netherlands, any Netherlands team, are they falling apart or have they got it together? You know, they. It, it fell apart in 1990. There was huge, huge ructions behind the scenes in 1990, and they fell apart in stereotypical Netherlands style in 1990. But then 92, they pulled it all together. They, they were a fantastic side in 92, and were, they were the best side. They lost the the penalty shootout against Denmark, and they should have won again the European Championship in 92. And after that, you know, a succession of, of you know. What could have been, you know, ninety eight was one as well. Um, you know, two thousand on home soil. You know, there, there were plenty of these opportunities for the Netherlands to to add to this nineteen eighty eight European Championship that, you know, just stylishly went amiss. Gary, in final word for you. Obviously, always with the Dutch. I guess you sleep easy now, knowing that Rena Smickles did what he should have done in in seventy four. 
Yeah, bless your cotton socks. Thank you for that, mate. The <laughs> one thing about the Dutch, the consistent thing about the Dutch is they're massively inconsistent. 1938, they qualified for the Europe for the World Cup. They didn't qualify again until 1974, and they got to the final. They didn't qualify. They then qualified in 78 and got to the final. They didn't qualify again until 1990. That, that, I mean, this is ridiculous. In so in 50, 50 odd years, they qualified for two tournaments and got to the final both times, losing to the host both times. Disaster in the European Championship right until 88 won the damn thing and then disappeared again. As you say, with a team that was, their key players were, were, were coming to their peak. But that's Dutch football. You know, it's I always described Dutch football as like a flame. It burns bright, but it's ephemeral. It don't burn for very long. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Gary. It, I, I feel like it's a waste of time me now saying anything. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's been brilliant. First of all, it's been great to see you. Um, <laughs> I think, like I say, hopefully, um, I'm not saying people will enjoy looking at us, but they might at least just start putting uh, faces to names. Um, obviously, always a pleasure to chat to you all about football. Um, we'll, we'll see how, how well this is received and we'll, um, maybe we'll pick another game where there's maybe a little bit more action to talk about and, and not so much about the incidentals. Um, Aidan, thanks very much. You're welcome. It's been great. Cheers, Stuart. No worries. Stephen, as always, thanks very much. Oh, Joe, as always, Stu. And Gary, obviously, you can just go and raise a glass and reminisce about Dutch football once more. Good health, gentlemen. Brilliant. <laughs> All right. See you soon, fellas. <laughs>